Allah, uh, with us here in the house of uh, uh, Zakah and Waqaf, I think uh, we have gone a little bit above the minimum, huh? which is very good. Uh, we'll just need to add few departments. But in most uh, Zakah uh, institutions, you find one or two individuals running those zakah. And like uh, some of you, the sister says yesterday, even here in the part of the countries, you have places where only one imam in the mosque, he, he, he runs the zakah. So this becomes a big, a big problem of governance. How do you, uh, you know, distribute responsibilities? How do you hold accountability? Where is transparency? Where is disclosure? It becomes a big problem. And then the other problem with the governance is also lack of records and data. Hmm? Uh, we have not been able to build good database because good database help us to do analysis on ourselves, uh, what our new direction is, uh, how do we formulate our strategy. We need data. Uh, for example, do we have data on the number of people who do not comply and uh, what are the reasons why they don't comply do we have data on the challenges that we face uh, over the years in collecting zakah are these challenges constant or they keep on changing what are the new challenges that emerge how do we deal with them so those data help us to move forward so we need to have proper records and database hmm? especially of those who we think are potential for the organization. <clears throat> so the other challenges also we find is strategic planning. Uh, in as much as we have a training, my suggestion is that any organization, every six months you call your members, you brainstorm on strategic planning. In fact, it should be at the beginning of the year. Everybody comes with the idea, okay, within this coming two years, how do we look at ourselves, both locally and internationally? How do we want to position ourselves? And what are the indicators that will help us to achieve them? And what is the output? What is the impact on the people? What is, what is, what is all this? We have to put them in a strategic plan. And at the end of the year, we have another meeting to evaluate ourselves. How much have we achieved? How much is remaining? How much should be strategized? Do we need to add more? Or what are the adjustments we need to make? So those strategic plannings are very, very important. In fact, it should be a document for every member. Every member who works should have that shared vision, shared mission. Then we'll be working towards one goal as an organization. Otherwise, people will be working as individuals not organization. So, lack of transparency and disclosure, this is very costly, we discuss about it. We need to enhance transparency and disclosure. The kind of data we show, the detailed data, uh, the use of our website will help us a lot huh, to improve on those challenges. Next. Now, the next challenge is the human resource. And I think, alhamdulillah, I congratulate um, all of you that this is one thing you have, uh, I'm sure you had a lot of steps uh, taken towards this direction. And um, as I suggested earlier, apart from this general training, you need to have focus training. Hmm? And you should have different levels. Because I was asking uh, IDB when they sent to me the letter, I was asking what is the level of uh, the participants. Should the training be basic? Should it be intermediate? Should it be advanced? Uh, and then who are the participants? So when I receive the list early, then I can position the training knowing who, when the list comes late, then already the slides have gone, it becomes a bit uh, challenging. So what I'm suggesting is that for future training, and I'll tell them also, Brother Mahmoud, you need to classify because all of you, mashallah, you're at different levels. Huh? Uh, and this is yani, it's not aib, it's not uh, because Allah gives people different abilities, uh, different ways of looking at things. Some of you, mashallah, may be good in the Sharia sides, 
Some may be good in the technical side. That's why there's takamul. Huh? We complement one another. So if there are people who you think, okay, are the technical people, we need to see, okay, what kind of training these technical people need. If our fuqaha need a kind of Sharia control, Sharia review, huh? how do they do review? What are the areas which are very uh, sensitive in zakah where if you put your fingers, you know there's a problem here. Huh? How do they detect those reviews? Okay, they go for review. Among you, they are accountants. Maybe now it's no longer about individuals. They want to go to the business. They want to go to those big corporations. How do we detect their zakah base, their zakah assets? How do we do calculations? Hmm? Maybe we go to bigger markets, maybe not here outside. Uh, you have like us home, uh, share markets. Uh? So those things, we need to classify them so that the training is structured uh, towards those things. Uh, so human resource development, we need to look at that uh, for skills. Uh? Uh, and then also the technology, technological skills of the members need to be improved. In one of the studies we did, we find that much of the challenges for Zaka institution is uh, the issue with technology. Mm? Um, many people tend to have either conservative uh, mind or uh, technological literacy is, needs to be uh, improved, mm? needs to be improved. So this is in terms of human resource. So for our case here, alhamdulillah, it's not so bad. The only thing is we need to have structured and targeted uh, kind of training uh, to upskill our, our human resource, okay? The next one is the challenge of infrastructure uh, and technology. As we have seen in the case of uh, Indonesia, you need to have a system. And there's a lot of what we call office management system, uh, which includes uh, the operation uh, through IT, the accounting sides uh, of, uh, of things, uh, and then you have those related to interface between the members. So this investment in technology is, is, is very important hmm? because poor infrastructure in terms of uh, whatever instrument you have, then we'll have also poor uh, results. Huh? So we need to enhance our technology uh, literacy. Huh? Next one. Then we have challenges of payment compliance. And I'm, I'm sure this is a big challenge. Huh? This is the biggest challenge. I had one of my PhD students doing for Saudi Arabia. He found it was also a big challenge in Saudi Arabia. Huh? Uh, especially among the businesses. Huh? So compliance is a big, a big challenge. Uh, one of the challenges because many people, and like I, I agree with what many of you said when we did this group work, lack of uh, awareness about uh, azzaka. Huh? This jahal is, is, is a very bad thing. Huh? So we need ways to use a lot of media to educate people about zakah through advertisements and promotion. The other second problem of compliance, as I told you, is trust deficit. Hmm? Uh, many people, even in the way I was teaching in Malaysia, you find quite a huge number of people decide to give their zakat to individuals huh? rather than giving to institutions. So we need to, and that's why I say data is very important. If you have a data of those people, then you will get the reason, and then you correct those reasons. Huh? So we need to get data, why do they pay to organizations, I mean to individuals, and not organization. What is the problem? Hmm? And there are also a group of people who evade zakah. They are so smart in doing hila, eh, tahayyul. Hmm? Uh, every time they want to dodge eh, eh, zakah. So they look only at the material side of zakah, but they don't look at zakah as something wajib and can have bad uh, consequences. Hmm? So this we need to have those remedy. Okay. Lastly, we have challenges of zakah recipients. And I think uh, Sheikh Nyanzi will remember, Haji will remember that when we were in South Africa, they were crying this was their big problem. 
that there is a lot of dependence and laziness. Hmm? Zakah recipients, whenever they hear Zakah, they want to have more rights than Zakah institutions. Hmm? Uh, and in fact, even they will demand to you, why you don't give to me? Huh? It's my right. Hmm? Uh, so they, they find it as a birth, uh, birth right. Hmm? Uh, so I think this is, uh, you know, uh, everywhere in South Africa, in fact, they say the same person will go and change clothes and come back again. Huh? Uh, but luckily they recognize. So, so how do you detect this kind of things? Huh? And um, I, I, I had somebody was telling me a very interesting case in America, because you see again the database because America has an integrated system. So they have this welfare fund. Huh? Mm -hmm. So they gave this guy money, and then this guy is married to another lady somewhere. So he went to another state thinking that I will get another welfare and these people will not know. As soon as he came, they just said, at such a time, this time, you receive blah, 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 blah. Why do you want to receive it for the second time? Hmm? So if you have an integrated system where you can detect uh, those people, then at least some of these uh, lazy people could be uh, weeded out. <clears throat> and the other thing is, maybe you have to think, we normally give out consumption goods a lot. Hmm? We have to see the ratio of zakah that we give. If your rate of zakah is more than 80% consumption good, there's a problem. For example, in the case of Wakaf, we did a study during those days in Malaysia. We found that more than 80%, 88% of Wakaf assets are illiquid physical assets. So if you want to develop those work-off assets, you don't have liquidity. Hmm? Liquidity is not there. So you need to keep a balance where you have part of your assets as which you give to the poor. You have to give them a kind of a, a capital goods instead of consumption goods. So you need now to look at the ratio. How much is it that you give uh, this fish, this, 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 they eat and it is finished, or you give them capital to improve uh, their well-being. So that ratio is very, very important. Huh? Consumption and capital goods. The other thing we discussed this morning is entrepreneurial skills. And this is something Zakah could try to work out on, including also Wakaf. You try to identify potential recipients. Those people you think are very smart. Believe me, they will be example for others. You train them, use Zakah money to train them, skill of business. How to do business, give them that ability. And I gave you an example of India where just through consultancy they transform the entire village uh, into self-reliance. So we need to identify in the whole country where are those dynamic groups which can become as a case study. We need to give cases. And, and that's why I like, uh, again, I keep on repeating your case of the school. It's a very interesting classical school to transform from tree to building. These are the kind of cases you need to do. Now do it in case of of business to give them entrepreneurial skills so that they can help themselves. In other words, try as much as possible to empower the recipients rather than making them dependent on, 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 on zakah. Hmm? They think that this is a livelihood, they should keep on depending on it forever. So you need to show uh, those cases. Now what is the AFA? What are the prospects that we have for zakah? We have talked about challenges, now we look at prospects. <clears throat> One of the good prospects is that Islam is the fastest growing religion. They predicted that by 2050, the biggest number of world population will be Muslims. 2050. And this is what the Sheikh was just saying now. So in other words, you have huge potential of zakah coming. That means you have people who will be paying. 
Okay? Now, the other thing that we look at is also expansion of Islamic institutions. Islamic banking in Uganda. Hmm? Muslim businesses. Okay? And you have also institutions like IUIU. I hope we have so many Islamic institutions here teaching zakah. Huh? And alhamdulillah, our sheikh in himself is just an institution, one institution. Because he has so many students here, uh, so he represents an institution. So we need other institutions like sheikh teaching people what? Zakah. So when that awareness increases, then the potential becomes huge. So we find, alhamdulillah, there's that increase in these uh, institutions, uh, particularly in the case of Uganda. The other thing was mentioned yesterday by Dr. Ishaq, that regional uh, CEO of IDB. He mentioned about Islamic global economy. He mentioned about the halal, uh, halal hub, halal economy. If you may know, this halal hub has around seven areas. <clears throat> they have Islamic finance. They have fashion, clothing. Islamic fashion. You know who is the first in Islamic fashion? Which country produces Islamic clothes? Number one. <clears throat> China. See how they go for the market? Fashion. Now can't we mobilize? Wallah, we have a lot of potential to produce uh, good Muslim clothes here. Okay? In fact, we grow cotton, okay? And then the next one is pharmaceutical, medicine and all this. Mostly European countries are taking that because the ingredients have to be halal. <coughs> They're taking charge in that. Then you have Islamic, quote-unquote, technology. Technology that is harmonious with Islam. Okay? Another thing which we can also do here, which is very interesting, is called... Halal tourism. Yes. People come to a hotel, especially those from the Middle East, they want to find that the toilet has good water, it has a place for prayers, the food is halal taken care of, there is a segregation, good for their wives, this. And many countries, for example, <coughs> Indonesia, was able to advance Singapore. When I went to Singapore in 1991, there used to be one prayer room. Uh, you are saying Allah Akbar, and here is a Christian next to you, and next to you is a Jew. You are in the same house. You say, La ilaha illallah. Huh? But when they found that many tourists are coming from the Middle East, you know what they did? They built a big mosque in the airport. They started catering for hotels. Japan, during those Olympics, you can see what they have done. They have started catering for Islamic tourism, halal tourism. <clears throat> so please, this is also an area which is very much growing. And of course, the biggest among this global economy is Islamic banking and, and finance. Huh? This is a huge, huge area. So it is estimated that by 2025, this industry will be 2.8 trillion US dollars. <clears throat> the halal industry globally is 2.8 trillion dollars. Okay? Now, this is something which is a potential for, for zakah. Hmm? Potential for zakah. <clears throat> What is the other effect we see? There are tremendous progress and prosperity in economies of Muslim countries like GCC. And interestingly, at least three of those countries are among the G20. Uh, G20. And of course, here also, inshallah, we expect our economy to grow. Hmm? So the other thing is, and which we discuss, is about that partnership. Zakah has attracted UNHCR, IMF, IDB. 
So we need to take advantage of those smart partnership huh? uh, to expand. Now, they estimated that in 2019, 2019 they estimated that the potential of zakah worldwide was 356 billion US dollars. Hmm? And they say this would grow at a percentage of around 5% uh, percent annually. <clears throat> so, and the United Nations also estimated that the entire collection of zakah worldwide has achieved only 10% of the potential of zakah globally. And like you're saying, for us here, we have achieved only less than 2%. Eh? So we need to look at those prospects. And I like what the Sheikh has said, that you are now the ambassadors. Eh? Uh, believe me, don't underrate the small things you do. Wallahi, don't underrate. The small things you do, you look at them as small, but they are big. Wallahi, they are very, very big. You may be surprised you're making history. You'll be part of a bigger history to come. The only thing is you need to have al-istikham. <coughs> Just be consistent. Hmm? Like uh, the Quran told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, istakim kama umirt. Just be steady fast. And just move. And then inshallah we will achieve uh, a lot. Okay? Now with these uh, short words, I now open for, please feel free to comment, uh, feel free to ask, and um, maybe I'll begin by, if you don't mind giving to our Sheikh, uh, but he may about the data, to do with the data. Data is very important. Uh, in some cases, we call it a uh, uh, bank. We, we, we collect it in people, get people who can pay Zaka, who can, or who people who can go and call people for Zaka. We put them in our bank. That is the data. But when we were in Malaysia, they gave us the same story which he gave us here, is that somebody can get zakah from here. And when he hears that in Jinja they are also giving zakah, you can get a taxi from here up to Jinja to get that zakah. But in Malaysia, they had these uh, cards, as you see this in Nangamoto. So the Nangamut is, uh, it is computerized. When you go there and collect the Zaka, they get your data all from that Nangamut. Whenever you go to another mosque for a Zaka, they say, yes, you give us Nangamut. They just ch check it, and if you okay, on such and such a date, in such and such an area, you go to Zaka. So you're not supposed to get Zaka here. For us, we have the experience of that. A person will find him in one day here, collecting zaka, not only zaka, begging, and so on and so forth. When he comes to a house of zaka, he says, Hello, brother, for us, we want our money. We are banaku. Kwagara said, It's a fee. If you are doing nothing. So that's a very big challenge to us. It's a very big challenge. I can give you another example. So, please check Jamil. Jamil is here. Uh, Jamil, can you stand up, please? Thank you. It's it down. A person came to our office, but yeah, I knew him back. That he's collecting money in such a way. When he came to the office, 
I told him that we don't have anything. He said, no, I don't want you, I want shit. After time, I wanted to leave the office. The man came to me, he shake, he shake, he shake. I said, no, I'm, I'm leaving. He went to shake Jamil. And Jamil came to me, he shake. I'm saying, you will see, you will see what you are. Why do you leave the man like that? I said, no, even I cannot take him. Shake Jamil wondered, and he went. Then after that, I ran to him, Sheikh Jamil. I couldn't help that man even because I know him. I have more than 10 phones from different areas. He's just going and begging, going, begging, 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 begging like that. So my point is, my brothers, data is very important. Even if you are mosque, even if when you are to go home, even if, if you are in the office, you try to keep data, you are going to know people and you know how to deal with them, inshallah. Uh, secondly, he talked about the point of uh, human resource. Yes. He said that here in, in our house of Zaka, we are okay. But still, so there is a need of putting much effort to say that we get a very good human resource, inshallah. I would like to add more. Let me request you also to bring yours. Shukran. Yes. and you talked about the International Monetary Fund, IMF. Uh, whenever I hear the word IMF here in Africa, I hear more cries than, like, uh, that people celebrating, talking about IMF. My question is, how does Zaka benefit from IMF, and how does IMF benefit from Zaka? Lastly, uh, you've been talking about aid and people having a donor dependence syndrome but uh, i read a book called dead aid by damisa moya and she argued that foreign aid provides half-baked solutions and easy answers and people do not always hold their leaders accountable now i'm just asking for your idea about that how possibly can we channel those funds that come from for example, from the rich Gulf countries coming to our countries in form of Zaka, in form of grants and others, how can we channel them for them to benefit people than people having that syndrome? Now I know why, Sheikh, you have such good products, huh? mashallah. These are, these are heavyweight questions. Huh? <clears throat> yeah, the first question, you're totally right. Um, IMF, they say the medicine they give you is more bitter than the sickness itself. I agree. There's something called IMF conditionality. When they give you a loan, they put a condition. And all these conditions are meant to make you pay back. For example, they will tell you, for you to pay us back, you need to make your export cheap. And for your export to be cheap, you have to devalue your currency. So once you devalue your currency, then the country doesn't have enough money to bring in all the necessities that the people need. The other thing they'll say is liberalize your economy so that all the big companies should come in and the small traders are just killed automatically because these guys will just take over. And the worst case is what we have been talking about, the riba. For example, it was reported that countries like Congo 
They borrowed only 500 million, but within certain period of time, plus the interest, they have to pay 5 billion. So in other words, until the day of Qiyama, you are still paying the interest, not even the, the yes. That's totally right. So coming to your second question, I agree with you 100%. So coming to the next question, so how do you put IMF in the equation? Or how do you put UNHCR in the equation when you talk about zakah? Now here is again the issue of outreach and the issue of management. Those two organizations come in to help in the distribution channel or at least soliciting others to add on those funds to help the people. So that is where their role only stop there, okay? And then with strict certain Sharia ruling, they don't just come in like this. You're coming in, ahlan wa sahlan, but these are the zakah rule. One, two, three, four. And I told you when we did study for UNDP in Malaysia, we came up also with the governance structure. One of them we say, you cannot use this money for operational cost. You cannot use this money for this. You cannot use for this. If you are okay, then this the partnership goes on. Okay? Now, the other thing you mentioned about um, the money coming from the Gulf. My suggestion would be you need to have targeted funds. Targeted funds. One example you can see is our mosque in Old Kampala. Do we know when the foundation was laid? In the early 70s. When was the mosque built? Exactly. Each time they send the fund, it disappears in thin air. Huh? Until the Mufti at the time says, okay, we don't need money, just give us the key of the masjid. And it worked. So in other words, have targeted funds. Say, please provide funds for orphanage. Please provide funds, and I like what al Hajj says, for our microfinance. Please provide funds for this. You should have targeted funds. When you have that, it will work. It will really work. The same thing they are doing for our Islamic University in uh, Mbale. Eh? You have certain college, okay, we are going to build this hostel, we are going to do this, we are going to do this. So targeted, targeted funds. So we need to have those targeted funds, then it will come. But if you give it just general, even you yourself will be thinking of what to do with that money. Eh? So you should have that targeted fund. Thank you. <coughs> what was it? Huh? That why, why is IMF and UNDP and others, why are they interested in zakah? Okay, good. Why is UNDP, IMF and all this, why are they interested in zakah? For two reasons. One reason is, especially if we take the case of refugees. Majority of the refugees are who? Muslims. And by the way, IMF, the name is just IMF. But the shareholders, the money doesn't come from the bank. It comes from shareholders. Huh? Big banks, big corporations, big what? They provide to IMF. Even people like Bill Gates and etc. they control those funds. So if the shareholder says, no, we are not going to release funds to those Muslim refugees, okay? So one way out is for them to say, okay, for us to look good, we have to mobilize zakah funds. So it's a win-win situation. One win-win situation is they're showing that they're helping. But the only other good thing is because of their outreach, they can mobilize funds at a global level easily. They can go to governments, go to big institutions. That is why they come in, okay? <clears throat> No, okay. What have I think you need to carry both all the time. Man.
Maybe this is just an overall observation which I wanted us to include in our workshop to come. Well, that when you look at the population of Uganda, in fact, the population of the world, uh, even as per the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu one time he said, Hata yakunu lihamsina imra illa al-qayim al-wahid. So, the ratio of male to female, that of female surpasses that of male. So, in another workshop, I think we should have more lady representatives because when you go down on earth, you find that those ladies there in uh, the marketplaces and what and what might listen when they get a practical lady, for example, when she's a shekat, when she's a fellow workman, and when she's the one who is soliciting zakah from them. So uh, that's what my observation. The second observation is that uh, please we have gone into details of this third pillar, which I, I personally never knew. I call for the stakeholders of Islam now, not Zaka in particular, that if we get other workshops also to go deep in other pillars, right? Uh, so I think this has given us a good starting. We, when we go on and we look at other pillars, Islam will shine more than this. Those are my two comments. Yeah, so apparently it seems um, uh, either we are satisfied or we are contemplating um, or we are expecting. Huh? So, but in any case, really, I, I agree with the last comment that we need to have a lot of uh, uh, our sister's representation. I think, Jazakallah khair, that's a very good observation. Yeah, because... Uh, Apart from zakah and ummu, madrasatun in adattaha, adatta shaban tayyiba. Our sisters are schooled in themselves. If we prepare them well, we prepare good nations, uh, uh, even beyond zakah. And I agree with the also second uh, view that uh, because these are complementary things in our, uh, our deen. <coughs> so finally, what I would like to... To conclude, I don't know Brother Mahmoud is, uh, uh, is here, that inshallah, I think uh, to a great extent, um, um, the objectives for which the, the thing has been uh, uh, prepared, alhamdulillah, we are able to interact, uh, to know a lot of things about ourselves, and then inshallah, the next thing is to take it a little step further, uh, a little step further, so that we have more uh, practical uh, interaction uh, in the near future and um, uh, inshallah please uh, we pray for one another um, it is not only about building your capacity here so the last thing is if we have good people who can go and do uh, now we have a lot of Sharia people doing masters in zakah PhD in zakah uh, I think that will um, uh, really also expand our our knowledge 
And again, I keep on repeating that we need to have uh, a research group uh, in this organization. And finally, this is the final thing is please organize even online. Inshallah, once you have the IT facilities, organize seminars online. Uh, don't look at it as something simple, but it's a good way that people will know you have a lot of uh, groups, uh, global WhatsApp groups on Zaka, on Wakaf. Um, I see many of those organizations, they will send their advertisement uh, from Maldives, from South Africa, from where everybody will have those platforms. It doesn't cost much rather than just having to send people the link. But your outreach will be bigger, okay? So we need to think about having those seminars, having our big sheikh to speak something on zakah, uh, somebody to share his opinion, so we should encourage this culture. Now we'll have another 10 or 15 minutes for, you know, Shurb al-Ahwa well, uh, well, inter I hope I did not. Uh, so now I'll give it to Brother Hamza uh, to tell us the next program. Jazakumullah khair. Alhamdulillah, the Salat was Salat, and the Sulullah, Sulullah, and the Sulullah, or Bank. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think our salam should, uh, should be more uh, vibrant because we, we are concluding. Oh, we just said that the professor is going. <laughs> because we had created a bond with him that is very, very affectionate. Uh, I'm also uh, sad that I'm leaving. They, yeah, you're sad? <laughs> yes. They've been telling me that the man is very humble, yes, yes, the man is very knowledgeable, very, very humble, and they were, I was even bragging. No, they were asking, how did you know about him? No, listen, no, listen. So I didn't want to lie, but uh, I told them, Allah, that uh, I've never met him, but I have been speaking to him digitally online, and the man was so humble as he is now. So this is Professor Omar Mustafa Mohammed uh, is a very big uh, figure, or is a very vibrant figure in the Malaysian Islamic economic system. He's an economist uh, by training, sure. Yes. He's an economist by training and experience. And uh, my first knowledge of him was with, uh, when I was in the Central Bank of Indonesia, when I met uh, Professor Dr. Ifan Shayuk Bek. There is also Professor Dadam yes. Marzuani. Yes. I hope you know him. He was here in Uganda. Yeah, he told me he was here in Uganda. So he asked me, do you know Professor Mustafa Omar? Yes, yes, yes. He said he's a guru, a very big personality in the Islamic economy. So that's, that's the man, very humble. You will even find him on the street or in the hotel and pass by him without knowing him. That's the man, inshallah. Uh, on the panel here, we have uh, Sheikh Mahmoud Kibate, the CEO, House of Zakan Work for Uganda. Uh, we have Dr. Mahmoud Bekri, a research economist, Islamic Development Bank, uh, is uh, also very vibrant in that sector. And is a thing he's more wider than Zaka. Inshallah, if we get another chance, we might get him on a, on a different topic. Alhamdulillah. I'm bragging, brother. Inshallah. And we have brother Al Hajj uh, Mustafa Kor. Mustafa Kor is standing in, in the, uh, uh, the country manager, hub, the manager, hub manager of Islamic Development, Development Bank Group, Uganda who is a country on the many projects you had, you told him. Uh, this is the country operations manager, Uganda. So he's a very big person. And of course we have, I'll skip the professor, he's very popular now. We'll have Dr. Ibrahim Matovu, a founder member of the House of Zakan Work for Uganda. A director, he's a man of many hearts, in Kofia. He's a director, House of Zaka. He's also the director of education committee of the House of Zakan Work for Uganda and the director of many schools you, you know 
in, in Uganda. So our next uh, on the program, we have one of our trainees. We believe that uh, we've had a lot, you, you, you've learned a lot, and you'll uh, have to digest it maybe after this, uh, this workshop. So we would wish to invite one of one from you in three minutes to summarize what has been learned and how beneficial it's going to be and to give us assurances that he's going to transfer the same knowledge. Because this is training of trainers. IDB is training you to become trainers of other people who need training. Uh, before we call Sheikh Mubiru Swaleh, I wish to recognize Adi Muhammad Nyanzi. He is very far from here. But uh, Adi Nyanzi, I, would, I think, is one of the founders, not of House of Zakat, one of the founders or pioneers of what we call the Islamic social finance. Professor, I don't know how old the term social finance is in Southeast Asia. Um, it was coined in um, almost the last 10 years. Pardon? It was coined in the last 10 years when the first report of social finance from IDB yeah. uh, came out. Yeah. Social finance means the Islamic finance and banking. The banking goes for the central bank and others. The social finance is the SADAC. Sheikh Chigonya gives Sadak, we give this, we give that, without interest, without any paper, uh, without any transactional uh, uh, restrictions. So that's the social finance. He said 10 years back, but the idea to establish the House of Zakat, I think is 14 years back, with Adi Muhammad Nyaz and the other members. So the man is, as, uh, is older than the, his idea is older than the social finance term, alhamdulillah. So Sheikh Mubiru Swazi, we are giving you three minutes, please to summarize what has been learned to the audience. Then after you, we are going to have a Dr. Mahmoud Bakri to take us through the, the, the assessments and other issues, and then we shall have another process. Thank you, Chef. We can mix Luganda and English. Arabic, I think, is uh, over. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I am Sheikh Saleh Hemudiru, heading the Department of Da'wa in the House of Zaka, Uganda, and Wakfu. I've been privileged when I'm asked to give a when I'm asked to give what has been called a summary of what we have seen, what we have heard. In fact, I'm not giving a summary. I cannot sum up all that we have seen in three days. But I only have to say that Alhamdulillah, all the participants who have participated in this workshop have raised our level of awareness. There is what we call the Mustawal Wa'i. Our level of awareness on uh, Zaka affairs has really raised from, we were not at zero, it has raised to a level which can enable us to work hard so that awareness in other fields, like Zaka awareness in all uh, people can be raised. So I really assure you that we are very much grateful for this workshop, we intend to thank, first of all, House of Zaka for initiating this idea, and we thank the Islamic Development Bank for enabling this uh, workshop, and we thank uh, our trainer, Professor Mustafa, Professor Mustafa, we are very much 
privileged that you have been with us. Let me just remind you of a question which our Sheikh uh, gave us in the morning. The Sheikh told us, one of our trainees here, that now that we have attended this course, what next? They selected us with the 30 or the 29. We have been here for these three days. Now what next? The awareness we have got, alhamdulillah. So, I think each of us should go on thinking of what is next. With my suggest that, alhamdulillah, now that we have got House of Zaka, Uganda, we have got a starting point. I suggest we all join the House of Zaka. We come in to see that together we work so that awareness is lifted in the whole country. The Department of Da'awa will be approaching you to come and join us on the different programs we have because now what is next is to propagate the message to the community, to all people. So I think House of Zaka, Da'awa Department, should be ready to see that uh, now we have got the manpower. We are all ready to work with the House of Zaka, Dawa Department, to see that we propagate the message we have got from here. After that uh, remark, let me just remind you of one point in conclusion. Uh, Professor Mustafa, you pointed at one point, maybe in our first day. To me, it became the most important message I have got from this workshop. Hello. Professor Mustafa Rakaza at the point of Taqwa Allah in all our affairs. You reminded us of the word of Allah that وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ Professor, that was a very important point. Brothers and sisters, with the taqwa Allah, Allah will come into our nusra. The Professor intended to make us, to, to tell us, that you ittaqillah sayaj'allaka makharajan in all your affairs professor that was a very important point on it we can change all our life programs so that we become people with taqwa if we become people with taqwa Allah sayaj'allana makharajan wa sayarzukuna min haythi la nahtasib jazakumullah khairan that is all I could give as what you have termed to be a summary. It's not really a summary, but it's uh, just a simple remarks on what we have had in all these three days. Otherwise, on behalf of my fellow participants, we are very, very, very grateful. We thank Allah that as we thank Him for this, we expect more of such uh, workshops to be organized. فجزاكم الله خيرا Thank you so much Sheikh Mubiru Swale Sheikh Mubiru Swale is the head of the Dawa committee of the House of Zakan Work for Uganda we have the various committees and departments are operational but committees uh, some of the, the, what we call them the pushers on the ground. So it's one of those uh, in many radio programs, television programs, outreaches, is with us, alhamdulillah. Uh, without taking time, I would wish to recognize uh, Alhaji Lukumbi. Please stand up for recognition. 
Alhaji Rukumbi is here with us in the interest of the Chairman Board of Directors, Sheikh Abdelbed Kamregia. He, he sent his regards, alhamdulillah. Uh, I'm calling upon Dr. Mahmoud Bakri, Bakri, Research Economist, Islamic Development Bank Institute, uh, to take us through his uh, submissions. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Slowly we come to the end of uh, this training. Uh, my closing uh, speech or remarks will be split into two topics. Uh, the first part is, uh, is about uh, the evaluation uh, of uh, the participants of this training. Uh, I wanted to share with you your uh, your evaluation and and uh, the evaluation of uh, your colleagues uh, other participants um, we split it to uh, many uh, many topics we wanted to get your feedback on uh, the training goals on the content of the training on the trainer uh, and on the organization uh, part as well as uh, how much you think uh, you uh, benefited from the training. Uh, we ask you also two uh, qualitative questions. Uh, one is how you evaluate globally uh, the training. Uh, what was the best thing you learned from this training? And uh, as learning is a process, uh, we uh, ask you to give us suggestions uh, how to uh, uh, perform better and how to uh, uh, make, uh, make the training better in the future. Uh, mainly your comments was, were about uh, you wanted uh, more, uh, so the first assessment uh, was, was highly positive, so we can uh, talk about 4.8, 4.9 uh, global assessment. Um, the goals were particularly clear of the training. It is about managing zakat. Um, the content also was, uh, to some uh, extent, uh, the, the feedback was, was very positive uh, about the content, the material, uh, the practical cases. Uh, you apparently felt in love with the trainer, which is uh, it's understandable. <laughs> So big applause for him, and uh, the organization was good, uh, mashallah, the commitment was high, and uh, for the, you, you benefited, mainly benefited from, uh, from, from the, uh, I mean, benefited from the training. Um, so uh, particularly your, 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 uh, your remarks was about the number of participants. Many asked about uh, more participants. In fact, uh, as a training, we need to have, uh, a, a specified number so that you may interact with the trainer. So it is usually 20, uh, 25 uh, participants maximum uh, so that you interact, that the trainer can listen to your questions. So that's why it is for your benefit. You asked for more days uh, and more uh, trainings in the future. Inshallah, we try to, uh, to, uh, uh, to please you on that. Uh, it was also uh, on the language uh, and to spread it in more region. Uh, in fact, uh, again, I, I, I bring to your uh, mind again uh, um, the, in the beginning that we thought that, inshallah, you were the participant that you will take this knowledge, inshallah, and you will spread it among, uh, among, uh, among your, uh, your, uh, our brothers uh, and your colleagues. Um, Again, uh, it is important that you have the training skills, and then from there, I think once you master the, the content, you, 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 you are the best ambassadors for the training uh, to spread the knowledge among, uh, among, the, uh, among the, the colleagues. Again, uh, we cannot not learn enough. enough uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala يقول وما أُتِيتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا uh, and uh, Dua Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Quran, wa qul wa qul Rabbi zidni ilma. 
So it is important that, again, education is a process that you learn, that you perform. Uh, I, from your comments as well, it was very important to mention uh, that it was, mashallah, uh, brought by uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Mustafa Omar, and it was clear to your mind that inna Allah tayyibun la yaqbalu illa tayyiba. This is one of the hadith al uh, it's, it's hadith sahih. It's very important that you keep that in mind with all uh, the proofs also from Quran and the ayah that it uh, specifies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot have something haram and say, okay, if I make from it zakat and turn to be halal, this is impossible. Maybe to get something halal from it, uh, for, uh, halal first, and then we talk about zakat. Uh, uh, this is then uh, only possible with ikhlas. Uh, the things that you also mentioned that uh, many of you came to know that riba is haram. Uh, it is very interesting uh, to know that uh, uh, riba is, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announced war on uh, riba people, so you should have that in mind. Uh, for us, uh, that, uh, that first we should again, we cannot talk about zakat if we have income from interest or something, so this should be very clear to us. Uh, again, you mentioned uh, that uh, it brought you, the training brought you the governance. Governance is very important. And uh, without governance, without transparency, uh, we cannot talk about sustainability, uh, particularly when it comes for institutions. This brings us how to, uh, to, uh, to achieve this uh, governance. Uh, IT, uh, information technology uh, systems uh, are very important uh, for us to uh, have this governance in place. Uh, it is not only uh, how to reflect it to the other parts, but even inside the institution, there should, should be a governance, uh, I mean, a system that is very, uh, very uh, organized to, uh, to manage uh, well uh, 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 the institution, the collection first of zakat, and secondly, the distribution to who deserve to get it. Um, you also mentioned that it was interesting for you uh, to get the experiences of other countries, what have been done. Again, this is because education uh, and learning is a process. We learn from others, and uh, I'm I'm uh, uh, I'm confident that in some of uh, some couple of years we will talk about uh, an Ugandan experience that other countries uh, can learn from it because of the discipline, because of the commitment. Uh, and we support you in that, uh, uh, inshallah, that it is a journey uh, of, uh, of learning and of experiences that you build your own model, uh, that this model uh, take into account uh, the success stories, also the shortages what have been done in other countries, what should not be done. And from there we will have an Ugandan uh, experience that inshallah will uh, will also be a model that other countries uh, uh, will learn from it again thank you very much for your commitment for your presence uh, this is again part of uh, we should renew the niyyah uh, that it will be on our uh, uh, side of good deeds uh, this is what remain uh, at the end uh, and uh, I thank you again uh, I felt really between my brothers uh, and my sisters and uh, at the end I want to say uh, from the bottom of my heart thank you very much for being uh, paying attention to uh, to the training to be present uh, for the organization for the brothers uh, in house of zakat and waqf who uh, were uh, committed to deliver this training and uh, to the trainer who uh, uh, he also I mean, showed a uh, very um, uh, showed a lot of, of emotions to uh, to uh, to take uh, this uh, this training to the next level. Uh, uh,